Hello and welcome to Travel Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Unseen Histories. It's Violet here. This week we are travelling far back in time to witness the birth of history. Our guide on this long journey into the ancient world has spent his life studying and teaching Greek language and culture. But it was when he retired from academia that Professor Roderick Beaton finally found the time to write the book he had been dreaming about since he first visited Greece as a teenager. The Greeks, a global history, is a masterful, sweeping journey through 3,500 years that tells the stories of Greek people, their language and their culture. In this episode, Roderick takes us back to the year 447 BCE and the moment when Herodotus of Halicarnassus, newly arrived in Athens, sat down and began to write his histories and in doing so laid the foundations of the discipline of history itself. Roderick Beaton held the Corres Chair of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature at King's College, London, for 30 years until his retirement recently. He is now emeritus. Roderick is the author of several books, all of them connected to Greece and the Greek-speaking world. He is a Fellow of the British Academy, a Fellow of King's College, and Commander of the Order of Honour of the Hellenic Republic. I spoke to Roderick the other day. I'd like to welcome you to Travels Through Time, Professor Roderick Beaton. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation today. Hello, very glad to be with you. Thank you. Um, So we're going to be talking about your magisterial new book, The Greeks, A Global History, um, which starts in the year 1500 BCE and takes us um, on a riotous journey through the history of the Greeks uh, right up to the present day. And I wanted to ask you to start off with, um, you have you have been a professor of Greek language and history and literature for many, many years. And I wondered, is this a book that you have been sort of writing throughout your career? Is it? Do you see it in that well, way? Well, my formal career, my professional work has actually always been in the modern Greek world. So what I am professionally, I hope, expert in is modern Greek, its language, its culture, the history. Even that's quite a long story. It goes back about 800 years um, but this book, going back for three and a half thousand years, it's actually picking up on something I wanted to do when I was a teenager, before I was even a graduate or uh, still less a professor. Um, because I started off, my fascination with the Greek world, started off when I first went to Greece in my teens. Coincidentally, I began to learn ancient Greek at school at the same time. And something just clicked for me about this language that you hear spoken uh, volubly, loudly in this wonderful sunny landscape uh, in southern Europe, um, which is the modern form of the same language that was written 3,000 years ago um, in the great epic poems of Homer, the beginnings of modern literature, modern history, philosophy. And it's really that fascination with the longevity of the Greek language that kind of got me involved in the Greek world in the first place. As I say, academic specialisation being what it is, um, professionally I became what we call a neo-Hellenist. I worked on the modern end of that. And the other books that I've written have all been about different aspects of the literature, the culture, the history of Greece in relatively modern times. But... uh, I retired from uh, full-time academia three years ago, and this really gave me the opportunity I've always been waiting for to um, kind of let rip and explore the whole story of the of the Greeks. It was a wonderful journey writing it, I have to say. And how um, different or similar are is modern Greek to? Attic Greek, which was what um, Aristotle mm. and Plato wrote in, and then again Homeric Greek, which w- was 
even older. How how similar? How much has the language changed over that? Well, of course, of all languages change. That's part of the nature of a living language. It's like an organism. It's in constant evolution. And um, yes, let's be honest. I mean, the language of um, Aristotle and Plato is quite a lot different from the Greek you speak in, uh, you, you hear and spo- read in newspapers or speak in Athens or Thessaloniki uh, today. Um, the language of Homer who was writing only two or three hundred years before uh, those great Attic writers of the 5th century BC, is hugely more difficult again. The further back you go in time, the more different and more difficult the Greek language becomes exponentially. Um, Another way of putting that is, it seems, in the earliest days of the recorded Greek language, it was changing much more rapidly. And from about the time of the Roman Empire and the Christian Gospels, which were written also in the which were written in the Greek of the time, it has changed relatively little. Uh, so it's it's you know it's much if you take it from the perspective of a Greek speaker today, it's not that difficult to read the the New Testament. You need a bit dictionary and a bit of grammar to read Plato, and everybody needs both to read Homer, but they already did in ancient Alexandria, um, in the, you know, before the, uh, before the common era. Yeah. And was there a lot of difference between, because one of the, the, the themes of your book and one of the sort of real characteristic features of um, certainly early Greek history is that they, they travelled and they colonised and they, they went and lived in other parts of the Mediterranean. And I, I wonder, was there a, did dialects develop? So was there a difference between the Greek that was spoken in classical Athens compared to the Greek that was spoken in southern Italy? Or, or uh, yes, there know? was, very much so. And indeed, that, that was the principal, the principal dividing lines that the Greeks themselves in ancient times were aware of were between different groups of dialects. I mean, almost every city, every valley, every island had its own dialect of Greek. But these dialects themselves uh, form into larger families. And there were three main groups of Greek dialects which were spread across different areas of the Greek-speaking world. And Already in ancient times, the Greeks used the evidence of the language that people spoke in different places to trace the journeys that their ancestors must have made. Sometimes their explanations seem to us a bit fanciful, but we map that onto archaeology and we can trace really quite accurately the routes along which the Greeks must have travelled in ancient times, almost always by sea. The Greeks are great seafarers and they still are today. That's so interesting. So it's like a sort of a clue of, of how you can you can plot where they went. That's I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Um, so I wonder where when you start a project like this, um, where did you start? What did you um, what were your sort of guiding principles? Well, I mean, the basic point of the story was to make it a story. It's a narrative. Um, I've always loved novels and fiction and stories, and I think good history needs to read like a good story. Um, So it needed to have a starting point, hooks and points of suspense. It needed to begin at at a remote, almost mythical time in the past, and it needed to connect uh, at the end with today. So the story ends in the year when I finished writing it, uh, 2021. But, you know, how do you start? Where do you start? And I was actually, you know, you kind of, every writer, you know, that's a sort of writer's block moment, you know, pen to paper for his time, well, the keyboard nowadays. And I was actually walking along the seashore at Whitstable in Kent, where I live on a a windy, stormy November afternoon. And I suddenly thought, looking out over the sea, let's imagine a day at an arbitrary point in the very distant past, when the sun comes up, dawn spreads across the Middle East, the Eastern Mediterranean, and the area that we now call Greece. And I could just describe what you would see from above as the sun illuminates that landscape. And in that way, I began to craft the opening pages of the book 
um, which I confess I'm rather, <laughs> I'm rather proud of, because um, it is a kind of cinematic tableau of the sun coming up, and you see the different peoples, the languages, the cultures, how different they are, and then last to be illuminated by the morning sun on this imagined morning in 1500 BCE, you find an obscure group of mountain settlements in the southern Balkans, the area that we now call Greece. And these people are really nobody at the time. They're herders, they're farmers, they're quite poor, but they're tough warriors as well. And those are the people who will shortly become the first people known to history who would write the Greek language. That's how I started it. And this is a really, as we have said, a big, sweeping history book. And I I wonder if you have any thoughts on that kind of history because the, the, there's been a few books uh, on similar lines um, in recent decades that have been extremely successful. Um, I'm thinking of um, Peter Frankopan's The Silk Roads and, and books like that. What role do you think those kind of books play in um, communicating history to a popular audience? Well, I must admit, I'm a great fan of I'm a great fan of books like that. And uh, I mean, Frank Rupin's The Silk Rose, Ian Morris's Why the West Rules for Now, you know, the um, Homo Sapiens, and even and even Broadway, well, Hariri, I think the name is. I'm a, you know I'm a sucker for these books. I think they're I think they're wonderful, and these are examples of people who've really. You know, they've begun, I suppose all historians do, with a, you know, from a particular specialism, a professional specialism, but they've really sort of opened out towards the whole, you know, towards a much wider, bigger story. And that in turn, um, I think, has the effect of drawing in readers, um, which is something we, I mean, we need in the world today more than ever before, in the world of, uh, you know, of social media and, uh, you know, fake news and the various claims and counterclaims that are made. Um, it's never been more important to have a grasp of the, you know, the, not just the nitty gritty facts of history. I mean, a respect for facts, I think, is absolutely vital, but also for the narratives of history, for the sweep of history, and the sense that I think reading all of those books gives us that actually wherever and whoever whoever we are in the world today, we actually are part of something much bigger than ourselves and much bigger than our own little tribe or cell or you know community that we instinctively um, <clears throat> sort of latch onto, um, and often, you know, I think it makes us realise that we ourselves are the product of processes much bigger than ourselves in which we in turn have the opportunity to play our own parts um because i don't believe that the future is given laid down in advance i think each generation has the responsibility to create the future for the which will be lived in by the next and the you know in a way we're standing on all these shoulders but to look down vertically and grasp something of all these shoulders below us uh, I think it's um, you know I think it's a really important part of understanding ourselves our role and our you know our responsibilities in the world yeah and I think that's true from a sort of chronological point of view it's, it's really exhilarating to look back over that huge um, period of history and see how things have changed and how they've developed and how what we we have now is connected and has its roots like you talk about democracy and and all those other things which we get from the Greeks Um, but I think also from the point of view of geography so instead of looking at things from a very small sort of nationalistic point of view standing back a bit and this is what you I, I imagine this is why you wrote about the Greeks rather than just Greece, although I know you have written other books about Greece as a country. Um, So can you talk a little bit about how you structured the book, why you decided to write about the Greeks as a people and the language rather than as a nation this time? Well, absolutely. I mean, the the basic choice you have to make if you're dealing with such a long historical period is indeed, you know, as I was saying, it has to be a story. So what is the connecting thread? What what links this story? What what drives the story? And uh, there are different ways that it can be done. And in, I mean, since the 19th century, Greeks themselves um, have elaborated a, a lively and often uh, well, uh, very well, vividly told uh, narrative 
of the Greek nation, which developed through all kinds of um, ups and downs over thousands of years um, in order to result in the Greek nation state as, as it exists today. Um, but because I'm not Greek and because I'm writing about Greeks from a, you know, a cultural and literal physical distance, um, I wanted to take a slightly different, a distinctively different point of view, which is to focus on the Greek language. Because you can argue endlessly, and many of us do, about exactly what you mean by a nation, how nations are formed, how they change. Are nations, as we understand such things today, uh, many people argue that's really a characteristic of the modern world of the last couple of centuries. So it's almost by definition anachronistic to talk about nations in the modern sense if you're talking about the ancient or the medieval world. Um, these are concepts, if you like, that are up for grabs, up for negotiation, for discussion. But the language is a given. This language exists. The, the texts written in that language exist more or less continuously from about the year 1400 BCE right up until the present day. And what I set out to do in this book is to look as dispassionately as I could uh, but with an active fascination, at the people who wrote these documents that we know. What evidence could we find about the way they thought of themselves and their place in the world, about what they did, why they did it, who they thought they were, and what they in turn have given to us. So as I said, the connecting thread is the Greek language. And I kind of, I don't say this explicitly in the book, but my hope is that really by the end of the book, whether people are Greek, some people are reading it, they're going to be Greek themselves, others coming to the Greek world for the first time. I think it's for the reader to decide, are we talking about, does it make sense to talk about a single nation developing in a linear fashion? Or are we talking about multiple civilizations, peoples, groups, communities, which reinvented and reinvented so much that we still um, that we still use and value in the world today, but above all, fundamentally reinvented themselves. Um, and what can we learn from that process? And I know that we're going to be talking about one of the most, the earliest and most important um, writers in the Greek language in a minute. Um, but I think before we do that, uh, I'm going to ask you the question we ask all of our guests, which is, if you could travel back to a particular year in history, which year would it be? My chosen year is 447 BCE. And can you give us a brief overview of what life was like, what was happening in 447 BCE? Well, I'm looking at a particular corner of the world and fairly specifically at one city, the city of Athens, uh, perched on the very southern, southeastern edge of the, mod of the Balkans, facing the Aegean Sea um, in that year. This is a time when uh, what we call Greece, didn't exist in any political sense. Uh, a bunch of Greeks in Athens and Sparta and many other cities um, in that mainland, on many islands, and spread indeed right across the shores of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, all shared a language, a religion, a set of beliefs, a way of behaving, um, but they were not organised in any political kind of way. They instead each was loyal to their own city-state. And very recently, 30-odd years before my chosen year, the Greek islands and mainlands had been invaded by the biggest empire that the world had seen at that time, the empire of the Medes and Persians, set, centred upon modern-day Iran. And the Greeks banded together, not all of them, <clears throat> indeed only a minority of them, but some of the Greek city-states banded together and against all the odds they fought off the much more powerful invader. The Persians retreated across the sea, they were defeated um, in a naval battle off the island of Salamis near Athens in 480 BCE and finally seen off in a land battle not far from Athens uh, in a place called Plataea in Boeotia in 479 BCE. And ever since that time, the Greeks had been reconstructing their world, but 
after complete devastation and a completely unexpected victory. It was also the time when they really had to take stock. They had the opportunity to to build, to rebuild and to build their world from scratch. And that's what they were doing in the year 447 BCE. You have to imagine Athens, I mean, today it's a vast metropolis that fills the whole plain of Attica. In those days, there was just the, the sheer rock the Acropolis, the citadel in the very centre. There were a group of houses around the bottom uh, in, the, in the plain and <clears throat> areas of farmland all around. On the, uh, the town had been devastated, the city had been devastated. The temples to the gods on the top of the citadel had been, had been torched by the Persians. The sculptures had been thrown down. The place had been left in ruins. And the Athenians, as they rebuilt their city and they rebuilt their lives for more than 30 years, had left that space pretty much as after the Persian destruction. 447 BCE is the year when, under the leadership of an inspired uh, democratic leader called Pericles, the Athenians took the decision and began the actual physical work of reconstructing the central part of their city, the emblematic Acropolis dedicated to their gods. And so it was already functioning as a democracy, an ancient democracy, the city at this point. Indeed. I mean, we remember Athens as the birthplace of democracy. It probably was. Uh, we don't know a great deal about the earliest stages, but according to tradition, it was in the years 508 and 507 BCE that a set of radical reforms in the city-state of Athens ushered in the earliest phase of what a few decades later would be called in Greek demokratia, which literally means power of or to the people. But by the year 447, that demokratia, the early form of democracy, had become well established, it was institutionalised. It was very different in many ways from our representative democracy. Every male citizen had a vote and they spent all their time, a great deal of their time, arguing in huge assemblies about how they were going to conduct their affairs. And was Athens the only uh, democracy at that point? Because I know Sparta had its own very strange system. Um, were there other city-states that were being run in the same way as Athens at the time or not? There were. I mean, it's it's probable that Athens was the first, but I think even that's not certain. In the early, in the early first century, there were possibly half a dozen or a dozen city-states which were more or less democratic on the same kind of model. But by the middle of the century, by the year we're talking about, the Athenians had actually established quite an aggressive system of, they were creating nominal alliances of other Greek city-states against a future possible attack by Persia. But in the course of doing that, they were actually quite aggressive in ways that have modern parallels too, in exporting their political model to other city-states, whether actually the said city-states quite wanted it or not. <laughs> So democracy was spreading, uh, but not always by entirely democratic means. That's, that's funny, isn't it? Um, so I think uh, now um, let's go to your first scene, please. So can you take us there? We're still in Athens, aren't we? We're in Athens and the, uh, the programme for building the Acropolis is about to begin. We're going to come on to that. But I'm, I'm taking a slight risk here because we can't exactly prove this man was in this city at, on this date. But we're pretty close, and we are talking about two and a half thousand years ago. We allow latitude for this this far back in time. There, there's plenty of latitude for dates. Don't worry. Well, that's kind of you. I, 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 I will, <laughs> I will make, I will make the most of the opportunity. The man is Herodotus of Halicarnassus. He was born about forty. He's about forty years of age at the time. He was born about the time of the end of the Persian Wars, on the other side of the Aegean. The a small city then called Halicarnassus. It's today the fishing village and uh, tourist resort in southwestern Turkey called Bodrum. Um, it would become famous in history a little bit a century after Herodotus' time by another its citizens by the name of Mausolus. 
uh, that name might possibly ring a bell, Mausolus became famous because when he died, or before he died, he built the biggest tomb that anyone had ever built, in uh, apart from the Egyptian pyramids, to be buried in, and it became known afterwards as the Mausoleum, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That was in Halicarnassus as well, but that wasn't there in Herodotus' time. Herodotus grew up in Halicarnassus on the eastern side of the Aegean. At the time, his city was under the rule of the Persians, so he actually grew up as a subject of the great king of autocratic Persia. He was a man of extraordinary inquiring mind. He appears to have travelled all over the known world of his time. He went, we know he went to Egypt, he went to Italy, he may have travelled through the Black Sea and other parts of the Balkans, certainly the, and the Western Mediterranean. He conceived, seems to be the first person in the world, so far as we know, to conceive the idea of writing a narrative in prose which would record and commemorate the things that people had done, these are Herodotus' words, the things that people had done in the recent wars between Greeks and Persians. He insists on saying on both sides, and he also insists not only in recording what happened, but in discovering the causes, the reasons why it happened. This was the beginning of what we now call history. And it's no accident that the very first line of the book that Herodotus began to write in the year 447 BCE is, I'm about to set forth the results of my inquiry. And the Greek word in Herodotus' Ionic dialect at that time, which meant an inquiry, was historie. And from that word comes history. Herodotus, often called the father of history, is, I believe, the inventor of the whole genre of history, the whole idea of recording, commemorating, but above all, evaluating and seeking and understanding the causes of what happened. So far as we know, he began to write it in or very close to the year 447 and quite possibly when he arrived for the first time in Athens. And do we have any idea why? What gave him this idea? Do you think it was politically motivated? Do you think he was being sponsored by the Athenian state? Or do you think it was purely a personal impulse? It seems to have been a personal matter. I mean, he tra he'd, he'd travelled to many other places before he came to Athens. There's a, there was a lot, a lot of speculation. There are stories circulating in the ancient world that... Um, he was made welcome by the Athenians. He was rewarded by the Athenians for writing nice things ab about them in his history. But there, I mean, there are many Athenians sponsored. A lot, most of the surviving ancient Greek literature, indeed, is in some form Athenian. Herodotus, by contrast, is a relative outsider to uh, outsider to Athens, and <clears throat> he, I mean, he is nice about the Athenians, but not always. He certainly doesn't whitewash them. He does give other cities. Uh, by and large, their uh, their due. So the implication, I think, I think we have to believe him. He, this is his personal inquiry, and we have to imagine this man, off his own bat, um, taking ships, travelling with merchants or with mercenaries to strange parts of the world. We know he went to Egypt. He travelled up the Nile, and. Uh, you know, in those days, a book like a history is written on long papyrus scrolls. The papyrus, of course, coming from Egypt. But you couldn't manage something like that, you know, on a ship in a storm. He's probably got little wax tablets and he's got a thing called a stylus, a pointed stick that you, you use as, like a pen, just drawing shapes on the wax tablets. And he's somehow using, he's using that relatively recent invention of the Greek alphabet to record the words of the people that he interviews. And I mean, you could say he's the inventor not only of history, but of journalism. Because yeah. a lot of the, the nine books of his history take the form of what we would call interviews. Mm. And do you think, and this, oh, this is obviously going to be pure speculation, but there was already in Athens a an established tradition of literature and writing. Very much so, at yes. At this point. So do you think it's possible that having travelled around all these different places, he thought, right, 
the place to go next is Athens because I know that, you know, even just down to the practicalities of being able to get hold of enough papyrus to write it all down. Do you think that that was... Is that possible or is, is it impossible to say? Well, I suppose, strictly speaking, it's impossible to say, but it's a very, it's a very, it's a very attractive idea, actually. Why not? I mean, there was a, you're absolutely right. I mean, there was an awful lot of writing going on in Athens uh, at the time, um, whereas in, in, other, I mean, in other places we don't, we don't know. It may just because it hasn't survived. But certainly the impression we have of Athens's great rival, the militarist corporate society of Sparta in the southern Peloponnese, um, they, they don't seem to have been writing a great deal during that century, which is the great century of, um, of Greek literature and, and philosophy. The Spartans uh, wrote, uh, wrote poems and law codes in earlier centuries. They would again later. But... Um, I think you're right. Athens already was beginning to acquire the name that it certainly would later. And it, it probably Herodotus helped to build that reputation too. Athens as a great centre of Greek learning, which is how the Athenians later worked very hard to promote that, that idea of themselves to their fellow Greeks and later to the entire world. Um, and they were extremely successful at that. We still buy into that story. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And um, can you just give us a little flavour of what, for, for pe- listeners who haven't read any Herodotus, can you just tell us a bit about the kind of thing he wrote? And um, I mean, he was, it, it, his, his, they're very entertaining, a lot of his stories. And, so, and some of them are perhaps not entirely based in truth or I, 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 I don't know. The, the, I remember some stories about sheep with enormous tails or the, there's quite a lot of fabulous animals that he describes, aren't there? There are. There are the ants in India that are big, the ants that are bigger than dogs. Uh, there are the anthropophagi beyond the Caspian Sea who eat their elderly, eat their grandparents before they die. Uh, there are Ethiopians who hunt semi-wild ape-like creatures called troglodytes who live in caves. That's the origin of the word troglodytes that we still uh, still use. Um, now, Herodotus, I mean, again, it goes back to what I was saying about journalism. He had an eye for a story. And if he thought the story was worth telling, he would write it down. He also has a very delight. I mean, he's very he's very upfront. He's in he's part of his own story. He describes how he talk. He goes to those places. He talks to the people. Um, he um, he often uses the first person, and he will often say, you know, I personally find this incredible, but in such and such a place, they believe this. Uh, so he's he will, and he'll often coyly sort of turn to the reader and say, "Well, I don't believe this, but maybe you, you know, maybe you will." Um, the other thing about it, about his narrative as a story is, I mean, it's it's I mean, it's the first history, but it's also the first Shaggy Dog story. He starts out in, in book one by saying he's going to tell the story of the wars between the Greeks and the Persians. He doesn't get to those wars until book seven of nine. Um, the the whole of book two describes his travels in Egypt and uh, his marvelling at the pyramids and all these monuments of Egypt that are so much older even than Greek civilization. Um, he's got long digressions about how people lived in today's Russia or Central Asia or about Africa. Um, and again, I mean, this is if you like, Herodotus, Herodotus already in 447 BCE is showing just how global Greeks could be at that very early, uh, at that very early date. And he does deliver in the end, when he gets to the Persian Wars, he gives a very new, I mean, he is our principal source for what actually happened, but he gives a very nuanced series of insights into how it happened, into the ways in which some Greek city-states did band together and did fight against the common enemy, but he's also very frank about the majority who did not, and he dramatizes scenes in which Greeks are you know, interact with envoys from the Persians. The, the you know, King Xerxes, the all-powerful ruler of the world, sends an envoy to the Spartans and says, "Well, you know, you, it's ridiculous to fight against us. Why don't you just come over to our side?" And the Spartans say, 
we are people who live freely and make our own laws. You live under a monarch. You've never tasted freedom. If you ever did, you would come over to our side and you would die for the freedom that we have. It's wonderful stuff. Yeah, and it's amazing to have those kind of as you first-hand accounts of what happened and to, to be able to really hear the voices. Well, and he was so important, Herodotus. I mean, I don't think uh, you or I would have be doing the job we do now if it wasn't for him. So, um, wonderful. So let's go on to your second scene now, which um, I believe we're still, we're staying in Athens. Um, so tell us um, what's happening next. We are, and this is the big deal. This is the, the whole city is a, in the process of being transformed um, at, more or less, the moment when Herodotus arrives and starts filling in his scrolls of papyrus. The city, as I said earlier, has been left devastated for just over 30 years. But thanks to the repeatedly elected statesman Pericles, the Athenian assembly has been persuaded that now is the time to invest the cash dividends of 30 years of peace in redeveloping the centre of the city, the emblematic Acropolis, the citadel that dominates the city high, the land, city landscape high above. Now is the time to rebuild the devastating Acropolis as a monument to the gods, as also a kind of peace memorial to those who died and a celebration of the achievement of the Athenians in fighting off the enemy. Pericles drew together the uh, the most brilliant architects and craftsmen of the age. He gave them their instructions. They went away and they worked out the details of what they were going to do. Basically, they cleared the entire ground that had been the, the, sa the sacred ground at the centre of Athens on the top of this rock for centuries. They cleared off all the debris. They revered the, all the, the bits of sculpture from half-finished temples, things that had been half destroyed by the Persians, they didn't throw them away. They buried them reverently in the foundations of the new temples they were building. And many of these statues and pediments and relics have been recovered by modern archaeologists and they are stunningly displayed uh, today in the uh, Acropolis Museum, which was opened in 2009, just below the Acropolis of Athens. So having levelled the ground... Pericles and his architects determined there was going to be a brand new temple on the very highest point of the, the rock, not quite the same place where the previous temple had been. It was going to be dedicated, of course, to the patron goddess of the city, Athena, after whom the city is named. And it was going to celebrate the fact that uh, Athene, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, was also a virgin goddess. In Greek, Athena Parthenos, the virgin Athena. And from the Greek word Parthenos, meaning virgin, the building was called the Parthenon. And that name has stuck ever since. It was begun, the foundations were laid in 447 BCE. We do know that date and place pretty well for sure. Um, yeah. And it was finished in just 15 years. It was complete in 532 BC. Shortly afterwards, on the same space around it, uh, a new ceremonial entrance gateway in the form of a temple with columns and a huge monumental gateway was built, uh, framing the entrance where you climb up from the lower city to the Acropolis above. And a clue, I think, to the nature of this whole commemorative building programme um, was discovered actually quite recently in uh, by archaeologists looking, just looking at the alignment of the monumental gateway. The building on the gateway is called the Propylaea, which just means foregate or pre-gate. But if you stand inside that gateway and look outwards across the lower city, you see exactly framed between the lines of columns, you see the island of Salamis, and on a clear day, you can see quite clearly the narrow strip of sea that separates Salamis from the mainland of Attica. It's the exact spot where the Greek fleet led by the Athenians made 
the, in, the decisive victory against the Persians in 480 BCE. It's, it's a wonderful way of commemorating in timeless architecture a military success. I love that. And, and they've only just realised that that's quite a recent discovery. Well, I mean, it's always been there to see. Of course. But it's, but... A, it's, a, it's, a, it's an article published, I think, in the last 10 years by, by, um, by, by a couple of archaeologists who've been examining uh, the, the building and its, uh, its alignment and its structure, um, who actually, you know, I think, convincingly prove that it's not just an accident that you could see yeah. Salamis through this. That's actually part of the design. And in... Yeah, and it makes sense because they would have, you know, they would building it all from scratch so they could have chosen wherever to put that they could they could indeed and it's also worth noticing that um i mean again i think this is well known the alignment that's the you know the the orientation of the building the lines of columns of the propylaea which is the entrance where you see salamis through them the columns it's exactly the same it's mirrored in the parthenon itself which was begun first and that suggests that the idea of aligning the temple, the celebration of the goddess, um, that idea to, uh, to align that with the site of the victory is actually in the basic, the, the conception of the, very, of the very basic building programme. And the architecture of that particular building is so iconic and has gone on to influence architecture ever since. Do we know if it was a departure from what was there before? Was it a, a, a new style of architecture that they were building in? Or do, is that not something that we have any idea about? The, well, it used, it used the latest technology of the time, which, as was proved, I think, as long ago as the 18th century, involves um, some extraordinary subtle um, variations of, um, of height, um, uh, the way the stones are actually moulded so that the lines are very slightly curved in order to give the illusion that they're straight. And that was pretty much the latest mathematical technology of the time. But the columns of, of pedelic marble with the, uh, the fluting, with the, 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 what they call the, was called the Doric order, that's one that's quite, quite widely diffused throughout the Greek-speaking world. That's not in itself unusual. Um, it was. It wasn't even the largest Greek temple. The, the temple of Hera um, on Samos, the temple of uh, Artemis in Ephesus. These were these were even larger, but it was. It's often described as one of the, as it's the perfect example of the Doric order. It really brings that well well established uh, set of architectural conventions. It brings them together in its sort of ideal or perfect form. One thing that does seem to have been new about this temple. All Greek temples had decorations of various sorts around, particularly around the top under the roof and various forms of sculpture, um, sometimes fully in the round or sometimes what's called bas relief, that is a relief sculpture. Where it's only half moulded from a solid base. Um, these were mounted on the, what are called the pediments at the edge of the roof and sometimes along the sides as well. An innovation on the Parthenon was that not on the outside of the building at all, but at the top of the, above the inner row of columns, that is underneath the roof, in quite a dark space, and some uh, 60 feet above any observer passing on the ground, the sculptors created a set of marble slabs which create a panorama that moves chronologically from one corner of the building right round the four sides to meet in the centre of the eastern face. And this set of, there's an endless set of debates about ex what exactly is depicted in these scenes. We, there, are, there are pictures of, uh, it shows a procession, there are lively horsemen and uh, the na naked, uh, semi-naked uh, warriors on horseback. There are um, demurely clad women uh, carrying, uh, carrying things. And the climax seems to be the presentation of a, a, of a cloth of something, some woven garment to larger than life figures who appear to be the gods of Olympus, including, of course, Athena, the, uh, the patron goddess. It's often thought that it represents the procession which took place every four years in honour of the goddess, where people actually came in a ritual form up to the Acropolis. They carried out sacrifices in the open air in front of the building. 
But other explanations have been put forward. Nobody really knows uh, for sure. What we do know is that the uh, the sculpture overseen by the famous Greek architect uh, Phidias uh, really represents the high point of representational sculpture of the 5th century BC, uh, BCE. Wonderful. And it's still there for us to see. It's amazing, isn't it, after all those thousands of years? Well... Well, actually, it's not there. That's the that's a, a very oh, the, is the freeze not there? That's a very serious bone of contention, because approximately half of it is in the Brit- is in London is in London is in London <laughs> in the British Museum. Uh, about a quarter is today in the Acropolis Museum, uh, that was built partly with the aspiration of being able to exhibit the whole freeze um, close to the site of the original building, and. Other parts of it are, are, are scattered in different museums in the world, uh, particularly the, the Louvre. But these sculptures, uh, a large part of these sculptures, were removed from Athens at the beginning of the 19th century by the Earl of Elgin, um, yes, who are, along with the marbles. But uh, these are the famous. These are the these <laughs> are the Elgin marbles, which have been a, a, a bone of very serious contention uh, ever since. And where do you stand on that, if that's not too tricky a question? I've never taken a position on the, on the controversy of where these marbles <laughs> ought to be in the future. I think the story of how they came to be taken from Greece, how they came to be valued so much by rival collectors, that French and British collectors um, almost came to blows, literally came to blows, about who was going to capture those marbles and take them back to their own countries first. Um, the fact that collectors and connoisseurs, historians of art in Western Europe, thought these marbles were of such importance for their own capitals, for their own cities, for their own cultures. Um, Elgin himself wanted, he had an idea that the, the sculpture was going to become uh, a model for the arts and crafts in Britain in the 19th century. We might think that's a bit daft and certainly uh, you know, ripping off antiquities is not a very reputable way of going about it. But the fact that, the, the historical fact is fascinating that these sculptures that had been, let's face it, ignored on the building for 2,000 years suddenly at the beginning of the 19th century acquired enormous value and this was it was through the competition to acquire them that art historians really for the first time appreciated the true value and nature of Athenian of ancient Greek sculpture of the Periclean period so I'm not saying we owe that to Elgin who what he what he did was disreputable by any standards but the the story of how these marbles came to be um dispersed um, to the museums of the uh, of the world is in itself a fascinating story and it's part of the story indeed of how Greece as I would argue came became once again in modern times truly global. Yeah it's a complex issue and it will be interesting to see how it pans out in the future. Hi there, it's Peter here. Unseenhistories.com is now three months old and already it is packed full of enticing, illuminating and excellently presented historical material. If you give the site a visit today, you'll see many beautifully illustrated excerpts of books that we've featured on Travels Through Time. There's excerpts from Malcolm Gaskell's Ruin of All Witches, Nigel Pickford's Samuel Pepys and the Strange Wrecking of the Gloucester and Gary Shaw's Egyptian mythology, along with many others as well. For those of you who like maps, you might want to check out the utterly compelling series of pieces on the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862. That was a crucial moment in the American Civil War, along with a range of fabulously colourised images from Jordan Lloyd. It really is history for our times. Unseenhistories.com I think uh, it's time now for us to move on to your third and final scene, please. So um, can you tell us where you're going to take us next? Well, I'm going to take us for our last scene. and I, w- I will be a bit more brief with this one, but I'm going to take us a few miles up the road from Athens. Um, in modern terms, it's only about an hour's drive or less in the direction of the city or the town as it is now of Thebes in Boeotia. Because it was in the nature of the Greek city-states that 
sometimes these really rather small political organisations were constantly vying with one another, and this, the form of competition often took the form of active warfare. And the Athenians off and on spent hundreds of years fighting wars across the land frontier, just beyond their city, the mountains beyond their city, with their neighbours, the Boeotians. The Thebes is the main city of Boeotia. And in 447, the Athenians had been, <clears throat> they'd been building quite successfully uh, a kind of mini empire of uh, allied city-states on islands in the Aegean. And they were becoming quite successful in annexing or taking over or exercising influence over city-states on the mainland as well. And in doing that, they really aroused the uh, suspicion and the fear of their rivals, the Spartans, to the south. This was the beginning of the rivalry that would lead to the great war between Athens and Sparta, um, <clears throat> only three decades after 447. But in 447, the Athenians were defeated. And I think it's an astonishing footnote to the triumphs of that year. Herodotus starts writing the story of the amazing success of the Greeks in defeating the Persians. Pericles sets in motion the astonishingly ambitious building program to make Athens the greatest city in the world, as in a way it's been ever since. But that same year, just up the road, an Athenian army of a thousand soldiers actually got a thorough drubbing. They were defeated. They were turned to flight by the neighbouring Boeotians. And in the, in the wake of that defeat, the Athenians actually had to draw in their horns. They had, a year later, they had to make quite a humiliating treaty whereby they agreed that they would not extend, extend their political influence on the mainland at all. They would allow Sparta to dominate on the mainland. They would concentrate on the islands. And that actually is the beginning of the creation of two power blocks. You know, we think of the, the kind of great powers of the time, but in miniature, because the powers are tiny. This is Athens and Sparta. But in the small world of the Greek city-states, from 447 you really get consolidated the the naval block which is Athens which dominates by sea the land block which is Sparta which dominates by land and it becomes increasingly inevitable in the way the politics of the Greek city-states work that over the next decades these two great blocks are going to come to blows they're going to slug it out and that's to my mind the tragedy of ancient Greek civilization, that the Greeks, for all their wonderful achievements, they never found a way of working together to create something like the equivalent of an overarching state, something like a nation. Uh, it wasn't until 1830, the CE of our own era, that the Greeks actually created a Greek nation state. The ancients failed to do that. Instead, they fought to the death and a hundred years after 447, almost exactly, the Greek city-states had reached a state of mutual impotence. They could not, they were desperate to maintain their autonomy from each other, they would not agree to work together in any way, and they were simply ripe to be picked off by the next big power that set them in their sights, which is what happened. It's interesting, isn't it, that they couldn't find a way of and I wonder how things would have been different if they had found a way of working together and kind of joining up and forming it, because it would have been an empire, wouldn't it? It would have been small by empire standards. It wouldn't really have been an empire. I mean, it could have been something like the forerunner of a, <clears throat> of a modern nation state. And there's an often quoted passage in Herodotus' history where he, he imagines a scene where the Athenians describe, explain their reasons for maintaining their allegiance, the temporary allegiance to the alliance against the Persians because they share the same ancestry, the same language, the same gods, the same culture. And these are very much the definitions of a nation state today. And it's there set out in the words of Herodotus. But the Greeks never managed it, except only a few of them in very extreme circumstances during the Persian Wars. And when you say, you say that 1830, I think you, that's when the Greek nation established 
up until that point, did it, did they remain very much a bit like Italy? You know, if you ask someone where they come from, they would they wouldn't say they were Greek. They would say I'm Athenian, I'm Spartan. So did those city states sort of remain throughout that period as as being um, very important or or not? No, I'm afraid it's much more complicated than that, and that's why my book has almost six hundred pages. <laughs> And it could have been it could have been rather more. Um, no, I mean they became. Um, I mean, for as long as they were able to manage their own affairs, that's they did remain as city states. But they were conquered first by the Greeks to the north of Macedonia. Yeah, they were conquered by Philip the Second, the father of Alexander the Great, who went on to conquer much of the known world. The, that whole world was then conquered by Rome, and actually, for the best part of two thousand years, um, after that, the city states pretty well fell away, and. Almost everybody who spoke Greek um, became accustomed to describing themselves not as Greeks but as Romans because they'd been part of this Roman Empire for so long. And even as late as the 18th century, most Greek speakers would call themselves Romans. Um, in the Middle Ages, you've got the Byzantine civilization, it's a Christian civilization, but it's also politically the inheritor of the Roman Empire. So this was a civilization that spoke and wrote in Greek but called itself Roman. It's really quite a complicated story. And the, cre the creation of Greeks and Greece as a modern nation is something that happened really quite quickly at the, at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much. I, um, there's just one question left to ask, um, which is uh, if you could have taken something from one of these three scenes and brought it back with you to the present to keep as your own, um, what would it be? Well, it would never do to ask for a piece of the Parthenon, would it? That's got rather a bad name, thanks to uh, Lord <laughs> you and Elgin. Elgin, yeah. exactly. So I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not going there. Um, no, I think what I settle for instead, I would love to have just one of the rolled scrolls of papyrus on which Herodotus wrote his histories his demonstration of an inquiry of what people did and the reasons why they did them. I think that is an absolutely fantastic choice. Um, and I'm just surprised that you're limiting yourself to just one scroll, because I think you could have probably taken a few more. But that that's a great choice. Um, this has been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, Roderick. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it too. That was me. Violet Moller talking to Roderick Beaton the other day. The Greeks, A Global History, was published a couple of months ago and is available in all good bookshops. For more information and to see images illustrating this episode and all our previous ones, please visit tttpodcast.com. I hope you enjoyed listening. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>